Like, look, we got to where college football is evolving, right? Didn't have a playoff, finally got a playoff. Why not uh, vote for and hand out the Heisman Trophy after the bowl games have been played? We're now counting the stats. And some of these games, the playoff games, are the, the biggest games of the year. What are your thoughts as a guy who played it and now covers it on the idea of moving back when we hand out, vote for and hand out a Heisman Trophy? Well, I'm cool with that because you're right. The, the game has changed. You got extra games and you have conference championship games now. Back when I was playing and when you were uh, playing college basketball, we only had 11 football games and then you had your bowl game and it was about a month off if you were going to one of the, the bigger bowls uh, when you actually played the New Year's Day bowls on New Year's Day. What a novel idea that is. So I'm cool with that. You know what? I, I, long as, what I would like to see, Doug, let, let's crawl before we walk. I just like for these voters to wait until the conference championship games are over. Give me that at least. A lot of these folks had already voted. I waited to the last minute to vote. Uh, I, December 5th was the cutoff date, and I waited till December 5th to vote. Once we were done, the SEC championship game and all the other conference championship games, at least give the guys that. You have that last chance to make an impression. But a, a, the majority of these cats had already voted. It was amazing the number of votes that had already in prior to the last couple weeks of the season. What surprised you most about the bowl season thus far? About, about who? The, the bowl season. Uh, what surprised me the most, I would say it out to be Clemson, uh, just routing Ohio State in which they did. I didn't think Ohio State should have been invited to the party. Uh, they didn't win their division, let alone their conference championship. And I, I'm not just picking on them, but it's the truth. Uh, the facts are what they are. Penn State won the conference. Penn State beat them. They should have been in the, the college football playoff uh, as a conference champion because that means a lot to me. It carries a lot of weight. Obviously, it didn't to the, the playoff committee. So the fact that they were waxed in the manner in which they were, uh, I, I didn't think they they lay a goose egg on the board. I thought they would lose the ball game, but show a little bit better than they did. So that that was very surprising uh, to me. Uh, everything else, I, I think, pretty pretty much went as I, I thought it would. LSU holding Lamar Jackson, a Heisman winner, uh, and Louisville in check. Not surprised uh, at that score whatsoever. Uh, but everything else was uh, it was pretty much on par as far as where I thought it would go. All right. So the Big Ten struggles in bowl games yet again. Um, are you one of these guys that says you, you look at the Big Ten as a whole and you say it's overrated? Or is this a game-by-game -game thing? Look, SC won on a last-second field goal. Florida State won by a point, albeit one was a blocked extra point. But, you know, it was, it was less than a one-possession game, less than a full touchdown game. A lot of these are close games. Where do you stand on what we can read from the overall Big Ten after an outstanding regular season and a poor bowl performance? Well, I, I, how much time have you had off? That's the big thing. And everyone goes about navigating that time off prior to their bowl games differently. So I don't I don't place a whole bunch of stock into that. Uh, you look at the regular season and on a week-to-week -week basis, you look at which conference was better, and I thought it was clearly the Big Ten this year. We, we thought going into the season we'd have at least four uh, SEC teams with 10 wins a seasons, but that didn't uh, come to fruition. So I, I look at the bowl season as a totally different entity as opposed uh, when compared to the regular season because it's a week-by-week, day-by-day affair during the football season and then you take a nice little break you get out of rhythm uh, and so i don't put, put as much stock into those folks who like to wrap their arms around the, the conferences as a whole and, and what they did during bowl season uh, that's on each individual team at that point so totally different uh animal once you you enter in the bowl season everyone's got a different uh, clock they're working with in terms of when their bowl lands and how much preparation they have Brian Jones joining us on the Doug Gottlieb Show, CBS Sports Trader. You should tune in every morning, listen to Geo and Jones. Yeah, it's six, six to nine in the morning. Okay, but uh, that means you you sometimes can't stay up as late as you'd like to stay up. Did you stay up for the Sugar Bowl last night? Yes, I did. I, I stayed up and watched the Sugar Bowl. But here's the bad thing about working at six in the morning. Now, I love my gig. Thank you. I'm glad I got a job. But damn, these games run too long. I'm watching the, the Rose Bowl, which was spectacular. But it shouldn't last four and a half hours. I mean, come on. So I'm sitting there trying to enjoy that, knowing I've got another game right after that to, to navigate. And I'm just hoping that it will hurry up and finish so I can get through the the uh, Sugar Bowl, at least get to bed by 11, 11.30. So it, it's difficult at times, but it is football, and, and it's fun to watch. And, and so uh, you just have to deal with it. You know, first world problems. All right, let me, let me work backwards. We'll get to the Rose Bowl in a second. Brent Musburger uh, it had... You know, said he, he wished 
Joe Mixon hopes he has a good pro career, and there was some backlash, so then he reset it in the second half and said, this is a direct quote, apparently some people were very upset when I wish this man well at the next level. Let me make something perfectly clear. What he did with the young lady was brutal, uncalled for. He apologized for it. He was tearful. He got a second chance. He got a second chance from Bob Stoops. I happen to pull for people with a second chance is okay. Let me make that absolutely clear. I hope he has a wonderful career and he teaches people with that brutal, violent video. Okay? Second down and nine. What were your thoughts on what Musburger had to say last night during the game? It's his prerogative to say whatever the hell he, he wants to say. He's been in it a long, long time. I thought he went overboard. You state what occurred there uh, the first year the man was on campus, even before his first year had even commenced there at Oklahoma. You state what happened, you chronicle the details, and then you move on. Uh, he went uh, w way beyond that, uh, of course. As I said on Gio and Jones this morning, uh, what Joe Mixon uh, did was reprehensible. What he should have done is absorb the, the, the initial shove and then absorb the slap to the face, and then he should have called the authorities and had them deal with the young lady. That's the only way he could have handled that situation. Uh, so uh, it's unfortunate that uh, Brent Musburger decided to, to continue uh, with his diatribe on, on the subject, but uh, he, he should have just once again documented what happened and, and move on. Brian Jones joining us on CBS Sports Radio. All right, uh, uh, Sam Darnold. Uh, we've been following Sam Darnold since he was installed as a starting quarterback. I'm wondering, you know, now you're hearing people say, Dude, that's Andrew Luck. The only guy we've seen that big move that well, make those throws is Andrew Luck. What was your impression of the redshirt freshman quarterback? Well, welcome to the party. Uh, they're, they're, they're late. I remember when he was inserted into the starting line at the fourth game of the season there versus Utah, and I thought USC would win that ball game. Not because I knew a ton about Sam Darnold. I just had read enough about him leading up to that, that particular contest, and you could tell uh, what he was bringing to the table was infectious, and the, those guys in that locker room were going to believe in him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he played well. Uh, they had, oh, yeah, see, in that first quarter of that Utah game, they had three fumbles inside of Utah territory, or they win that ball game. Still, Utah had to have a late scoring touchdown uh, to pull out the victory. But uh, he definitely infused that team with stellar play at the quarterback position. He's a hell of a lot more fleet of foot than than you would think. Uh, big, strong guy, uh, incredible arm. So the the nation, if they hadn't seen him, uh, they got a chance to witness what's to come there for USC uh, in here in the next couple of years, or at least one more year. Uh, the guy's a tremendous athlete and football player. Great demeanor. Uh, so uh, he, he's fabulous, man. And we've been witnessing it since uh, that fourth game of the season versus Utah. All right. So Alabama changes offensive coordinators in the week before the championship game. This is – we haven't seen this. Like, we've seen guys take head coaching jobs and maybe leave. Some have stayed behind. We even happened to Alabama last year, defensive coordinator uh, with, with Kirby Smart. What are your thoughts on how much it affects the Crimson Tide heading into the game against Clemson? Well, Steve Sarkeesian taking over, he, and you know this as, as well as I do, and anyone that knows about their tenure there at SC, Kiffin and Sarkeesian under Pete Carroll during SC's heyday, uh, he and Kiffin are one and the same. They think alike. Uh, those guys jive so well when they were uh, running that offense at SC for, for Pete Carroll. So I don't think from a play-calling standpoint and, and, and the X's and O's standpoint, it's going to hurt one iota. What will hurt is that uh, that the little intricacies, that communication and, and that rapport you have with players because as an analyst or in that analyst role, which Alabama has a ton of those guys, they have changed the game as far as uh, these robust coaching staffs. You got those who are on the field who are hands-on, and then you got 10 to 12 or 15 more that are up in the in the, in the facility just breaking down tape and opponents and, and, and doing the recruiting stuff. So he hasn't been able to interact with these players on the field. He hasn't been able to interact with them in the hunt. Now he's going to have to do that. Uh, he, you know, having this, these extra couple of days uh, with the, Bulls, uh, the the championship game being Monday is going to go along with helping him uh, get get a feel for his players. But he's been sitting there and, and listening to everything. But now when you get in that heat of the battle, what type of rapport do you have with those players? And when you say something, does it have the same meaning? Does it resonate in the same way as it did to Jalen Hurts and others on that offense as it did when Lane Kiffin was the guy in their ear? So that's going to be interesting to watch. Is he going to be upstairs? Is he going to be downstairs? So we'll see how the communication, uh, that stuff works itself out during, during the ball game, especially when you get in those heated moments. And, and I think they're going to be multiple in this one. All right, look. Look, you have to have a, a dual threat quarterback to to beat the dual threat. Good, you have to be able to throw the football. Good throwing dual threat quarterbacks have given Alabama trouble. 
Uh, they it comes and has some dudes up front. A defensive, they look like an SEC team defensively up front. They got some players outside the numbers that can make some play. Galvin's been better in the second half of the season. So and and they they've been on this big stage before. They're not as good maybe all around as they were last year, but they've been on the big stage before. In your mind, you think Clemson's gonna win this game? Man, I. I so close to leaning towards Clemson, but with that Bama defense as great as they are, they're better than they were a year ago. And I know Eddie Jackson are leading that secondaries out, but Humphreys and Fitzpatrick and Harrison back there. Uh, and at that, that front, you know, eight, those guys, they rotate in and out, and Jonathan Allen and, and Tomlinson and, and those cats, and not to mention all those linebackers. I, I'm going to go with Bama slightly. I'm going to say 27 25, but I wouldn't be surprised if Clemson won this ball game. Uh, you're right. Familiarity brings confidence, and, and those guys were there a season ago, and you saw Deshaun Watson put that team on his back and damn near lead them to victory with over 500 yards of total offense, and he's going to be able to utilize his legs, which he's done a lot more here at the end of the season. He needs to stay away from the turnovers, but the key, I think Jalen Hurts for the first time this year, he, did, he had a putrid uh, affair this past weekend versus Washington, but I think he will really... Uh, he, he may struggle a lot going up against this this this, this pass rush of uh, Clemson. If they can get Jalen Hurts and Bama in those third and longs, look out for Watkins and, and Wilkins and Farrell. And, and those guys know how to hunt just as much as Alabama. So uh, these are going to be two stellar defenses. It should be a dynamite football game. I'm leaning Bama, but just slightly.